Right, some stuff on, on motion. Um, we, we did a little bit of this um, earlier, and uh, this is an extension to that material. And uh, the things I'm going to um, look at are a little bit of work on, on kinetic energy. We'll, we'll consider elastic potential energy and also look at, at simple harmonic motion. And uh, this is all work that's been chosen because we think it's of relevance to, to those of you that are, that are starting uh, to look at chemistry in more detail. Work, work done. If you take a, a mass, an object, M here, and you move it a, a small distance, or a distance, which we're saying uh, ds, and it goes from position 1 to position 2, then the work done, this, this strange term that stems from the Industrial Revolution, is equal to the force applied multiplied by the distance traveled. And, and we've said before, please try and learn the expression fs for work done. The units for work are, are joules, and work is just the energy involved in doing something. Joule, James Prescott Joule is who that's named after. D means a tiny little bit. And so you can write the expression for work as this. You can say dw, a little bit of work is done, if a force moves an object through a little distance. If you want to know the work that's done, what you have to say is this. It's the force which is remaining constant as the object is moved multiplied by the sum of all the little distances that go into making the complete journey. You're imagining that moving from position 1 to position 2 here can be broken down into a, an infinite number of tiny, tiny steps, infinitesimally small steps. And then to work out the, the total work that's done, you say the force multiplied by the sum, and that's where the integral sign comes from, it's an extended s. Okay? The sum of all the little tiny steps going from um, position 1 to position 2. So you end up with W equals F, integral sign, uh, 2 on top, 1 on the bottom, DS. This is called integration with limits. It's the sum of all the little steps taken and going from point 1 to point 2. Integration made simple. Um, I hope that you're, you're familiar with this, and, and if you're not, that you'll do some, some additional math so that you're going to find very useful. If you want to integrate X to any power N... Um, with respect to, or dx, um, then you, it, it just becomes 1 over n plus 1 x to the power n plus 1 plus c. You always have to have a constant in there. So x, which is the same as x to the power 1, becomes a half x squared plus c. So that's a general uh, rule for integration. So if we say that the expression for work done is uh, f force multiplied by the sum of all the little steps of distance that go into making the journey, and we know that f equals ma force is equal to mass times acceleration, and we know that acceleration is the same as dv by dt, then of course what we can do is to take this term, m dv by dt, and we can substitute it in here, and you end up with this expression, that, that work is equal to the uh, integral of m dv by dt um, ds. So what we've done is we have substituted this for f. And we know that ds by dt, the rate of change of distance with respect to time, is velocity. And so what you can do is you can take this and you can change that for velocity. And if you do so and you rearrange just slightly, you'll end up with a new expression for w, for work. And here it is. Work is equal to the, the integral of mv dv between points 1 and 2. If you do that, um, integration, you will get that W is a half mv squared, and that's because you're saying that m is to the power 1. So when you integrate it, you get a half um, v squared. So that's appeared there. You're doing integration with limits. You're saying you're going from position 1 to position 2. And so if you do some calculus in, in your additional maths, you, you'll be okay with this, and you'll see that W becomes a half mv 2 squared minus a half mv 1 squared. Now, we're saying that the work done represents an energy change. And what we're really saying is we're, we're pushing this object, and so obviously its kinetic energy is going to change. It's going to accelerate. It's going to be doing a different speed. Its kinetic energy will change. And so what you can say is that this is obviously um, means that we've got Ke at position 2, and this here means that we've got Ke at position 1. And what that means very simply is that a general term for, for kinetic energy is going to be just this without the number in it, a half mv squared. So that gives you 
an expression which you will have been taught at GCSE. Ke, kinetic energy, is a half mv squared. The reason for, for showing you that isn't that you, you've got to be able to derive it, it's to try and give you some familiarity with, with calculus to explain to you what the long s, the integration, means a sum uh, of lots of small incremental steps. Uh, and this is a very useful and transferable thing. You'll see this a lot in, in, uh, in your studies. The expression a half mv squared, this is important, it's described as translational kinetic energy, going from one place to another, as opposed to rotational. Things can have rotational kinetic energy as well, how fast they're spinning effectively. Also important in physical chemistry, but there's a different set of, of equations for that. So a half mv squared, translational kinetic energy. Still got units of the joule. As it says here, all forms of energy have got the same unit, uh, which is the joule, named after James Joule. And if you want a useful sort of way to think of that, I find this quite amusing, one joule uh, is what it takes for one heartbeat. Here's some little bit of revision for you. You can, you can look at this in, in your own time, go through it nice and steadily if you like. Um, you, you, you need to be familiar with all of this. Speed um, is the rate of change of distance. And you might write that as dx by dt in calculus notation. Distance divided by time. Acceleration. That's the rate of change of velocity. Remember, it's a, it's a vector quantity, if you're, if you're being really careful about this stuff. You might write dv by dt. Or you can have the second derivative, remember, where you get dx squared by dt squared. So you take the function um, for, for the distance time graph that gives you the shape of whatever line it is you see. If you differentiate it once, you get um, a velocity expression. If you differentiate that again, the second derivative, you get acceleration. d2x by d t squared. Momentum, p, little p. Um, it's uh, mass times velocity, mv. Force, f. Okay, well in this case what we want is force is mass times acceleration. Okay, so we say it's, it's the rate of change of momentum. That was actually how Newton defined it. dmv by dt. Have to imagine that m is a constant. Kinetic energy, unit the joule, a half mv squared. Okay, masses on springs um, at rest and oscillating, moving up and down. Oh, oscillatory motion. Useful physics for chemists. Chemical bonds uh, can, are, can be regarded and, and studied as exactly the same way as you might study a mass on a spring. Infrared spectroscopy stands on this. If you take a, a mass um, on a spring, and uh, it's at rest. It's simply not moving. So what this diagram here is showing is, is that the spring had a, had a natural length, which, which is, is here. And then we add the mass to it, and it extends by a small amount, E. And so it's the weight. Remember, mass times acceleration is force. Weight is a force. Uh, and so although we, you might write force equals mass times acceleration, when you're using acceleration as G, gravity, then you can say that, that weight is mass times g. Terrible writing, I'm sorry. If you then pull it down slightly, you then get a further extension, which you, you just write as x. And there's a force on that mass, which is trying to pull it upwards. To do that, you've almost certainly added a, a, another force from you as well. Okay, So there's a force in the, in the spring, which is, which is just trying to pull it back to where it was, back to its equilibrium position, a restoring force. What forces act on a mass on a spring? Um, firstly, at equilibrium, at balance, just left alone, um, at various points in its oscillation, if it's pulled and then released. And we're going to consider ideas like the net force, the overall force acting on the object, the momentum, the mass times the velocity of the object, its kinetic energy, its potential energy, and the total energy of, of the system. So without the mass, we're saying the spring has got some natural length L, and with the mass, it extends by, by a little amount um, extra, which is x, the extension. I've written IR spectroscopy down here. That's, that's the reason why you should try and get your head around this. It's going to help you understand your spectroscopy a bit better. At equilibrium, at balance, <coughs> there is no motion. There is no change in motion, and therefore there's no acceleration. And therefore you have to say that there is no net force. There is no overall force acting on that object. It's quite happy. Hence, the weight of the mass, which is pulling downwards, must be balanced by the tension in the spring, a restoring force. Classic school experiment. I'm sure you remember doing this. You, you have a spring and a, and, a, and a mass on the end, 
and um, you, you sort of increase the masses or increase the force on the spring and, and then you, you plot weight being the force measured in newtons and that's the thing you've got control of so it goes on the x-axis and then you measure the extension of the spring and you should get a straight line and you, you say that um, you've confirmed Hooke's law. Um, force is proportional to extension and remember that that alpha, that proportionality sign, means is directly proportional to double when the other doubles and so on, okay? Therefore, you could write force is proportional to extension in that way. Or, remember that if you want to get rid of a proportionality sign, then you need to include an equals and a constant. And so you can write force equals kx. That's mathematically valid. Hooke's law states that for small extensions, the restoring force is proportional to the extension. So it's for small extensions. As you pull it down, there's a force trying to put it back where it was and that the size of that force that tries to put it back where it was goes up in, uh, in, as, a, as a direct factor of how far down you've, you've moved it, you've pulled it. So if you, if you double the distance, it pulls back twice as hard. So in order to, to say that it's a restoring force, we're, we're using this, this negative sign, that it's, it's acting in opposition to the force that you're applying to it. Hook, Robert Hooke, also responsible for naming cell cells. Look him up. Right. Um, Newton's second law allows us to work out the weight because we're saying A, acceleration, gravity in this case, acceleration due to gravity. Force is mg, mass times acceleration due to gravity, 9.81 metres per second squared at the Earth's surface. If the mass is at equilibrium, it's quite happy where it is, then the weight is going to be equal to the restoring force. It's not continuing to go downwards, it's just where it is. So there's obviously a force acting upwards, balancing out the force that is the weight. Elastic potential energy. So, so here we are um, using some elastic potential energy there. What is the energy transformation that's going on in that picture? Well, it's chemical energy in the, uh, in the archer's lunch. And that's then transformed into kinetic energy as the bow is stretched. And then as that's released, and, and you've, you've got strain um, potential energy in there, of course, in, in the bow. And then that, that is what we call elastic potential energy. And then as it's released, that elastic potential energy is converted back into kinetic energy of the arrow. The force to stretch a spring, we're, we're abbreviating to F, and it stretches by an amount X. The change in the potential energy associated with the force that you're using to stretch the spring is equal to the work done. There's an opposition thing going on, and so we, we actually have to, for the sake of, of being correct about this, it's equal to the negative of the work done. Back to springs. Work is done when the spring is stretched. You had to do something. You needed to apply a force and some effort. And so there's the spring and, and uh, at its equilibrium position, and there's a restoring force coming from the tension of the spring, and there's weight of this mass pulling it downwards. Then there's an extension, so you have to apply an external force that adds to the weight. So force plus mg is the total downward force. And we've got tension in the spring, which I've abbreviated here again to T. OK, so tension provides a restoring force. It pulls upwards. Force equals K, the spring constant, times X, the displacement. That was, that was Hooke's law. And the work done is equal to the force times the distance. Okay, so W equals Fx. So you can say that a little bit of work is done when a force moves through a little distance. DW equals Fdx. So we have that F equals minus Kx. If we're being um, very accurate about this, remember that it's a, it's a restoring force. It's going to go in the opposite direction as the force which you apply. So therefore we have to put a, a minus in because we're dealing with vector quantities, size and direction. So F is minus Kx. You can also say that a little bit of work is done when a force moves through a little distance. And therefore, what we're going to be able to do is to substitute this for this. And we do that here. DW, um, we're going to lose the negative sign um, just to keep things a little bit simpler for us. Okay, So we're just going to say that numerically their value is, is equal, so it's fine. DW equals KX DX. So what you end up now is this. What's the total amount of work done? Well, in order to do that, you have to take um, the integral. You have to add up all the little bits of work that are done um, as we, we stretch our spring through a, an almost infinite, well, an infinite number is the theory, of, of little tiny distances as, as the mass moves downwards. So you say the integral between position 1 and position 2 um, 
is, is it okay? So the integral of dw is going to be k, that's a constant, it doesn't change, multiplied by the integral of x dx, okay? All the little steps of the journey that make x what it is, okay? That, that's that distance, all the little tiny incremental steps. If you integrate that, you'll get w1 minus w2, the work done in moving posi between position 1 and position 2, that's what that means, equals k, unchanged, outside the brackets because it's a constant, a half x at position 2, squared minus a half x position one squared. This gives you this term. If you put, um, just tidy that up a little bit, what this is telling you is that w1 minus w2, that the, the work done, okay, is a half kx position two squared minus a half kx at position one squared. But we know that work done is a change in potential energy. It, it, required that you, it required energy. You did something. You stretched the spring. As you stretched the spring, you changed the potential energy of, of, of the mass of the system, really. And so work done is a change in potential energy. Here is a, um, the term that is, that is changing, half k x squared. Here relating to the mass being at position 2, and here with the mass re, um, relating to the mass at position 1. And so the term a half k x squared is defined as potential energy. And because we're talking about springs, we're talking about elastic potential energy, a half kx squared. Again, the reason for showing you that isn't that you need to be able to derive it. It's just healthy to try and see how a little bit of calculus can be used, especially integration, sum, um, adding up all, all of the, the little steps in a journey. Okay, So that, that was the point of showing you that. It was integration with, with limits. If you take a mass on a spring and you pull it and then release it, the thing will, will oscillate. And this can be described as simple harmonic motion, and we, we come on to that later. And the question is, why don't systems like this really oscillate forever? Well, you've got friction, so there's going to be air resistance and forces within the spring itself. A little bit of heat will be lost inside the spring. The spring actually warms up. If you now imagine a system where, where we've frozen um, photographs, if you like, this one here, is, is meant to represent that the, the spring has, has gone up as far as it can go. And that, that was that picture there. It comes down through the middle, down to the bottom as far as it can go, back up to the middle, top, and so on. So we're, we're sort of taking the journey in three steps. If we imagine that this mass is at the top of its travel, um, what we're going to ask is, what do we think these quantities will be? Well, acceleration. Acceleration has got to be a maximum. It's, it's going to be gaining speed as quickly as it can. It's on its way down. Does it have any elastic potential energy in the spring? You can have a think about that. Um, I think the answer is no. Um, you have to imagine that what's go what, what it's got is gravitational potential energy. The mass has got that, which is going to be converted to kinetic energy to make it move back down again. The speed at the top is zero, and therefore its kinetic energy is zero. In the middle, there is no acceleration. The object is going as fast as it can. It can't gain any more speed. It can only lose speed. Um, it's elastic potential energy in the spring. No, at that point, it's, it's, it's sort of just relaxed. It's actually momentarily at the equilibrium position. The speed is a maximum, and therefore its kinetic energy is a maximum. At the bottom, acceleration is a maximum upwards. It's going to be pulling this object um, back up again. The elastic potential energy has got to be a maximum because the spring has been stretched as far as it's going to go in, in, in our system here and the speed has got to be zero it momentarily comes to rest and therefore if it's speed zero then its kinetic energy is zero so back to that spring keep going with the spring it oscillates so it's, it's going to move up and down at maximum ex extension it goes down as far as it can we can say that this is just to reiterate really the speed is zero the momentum is zero the kinetic energy is zero it's stopped momentarily the potential energy of oscillation is stored in the spring. And so at this point, right at the very bottom, the potential energy is a maximum. And that was the, the term which we, we derived for um, elastic potential energy. The net force, you can look at this in, in your own time if you like, but it's, it's going to be the spring constant multiplied by the distance. And that is x, which is the, the extension which you get on the spring when you just hang the mass on it, plus a little bit of extra extension you're going to get because you've pulled it. Okay, you've applied a force to make it oscillate. And so there's the net force, and that is the restoring force. And, but, of course, there's always the weight acting downwards. So there's a restoring force trying to pull the, the mass up, but there's, there's always the weight trying to pull it downwards. So acceleration is directed upwards, and that's telling you that, really, the restoring force is bigger than the weight. It's the, it's the larger of, of the forces. It's winning. And so um, that, that's, that's what we can conclude from that. 
As it goes upwards, it returns through the equilibrium position. Um, here, velocity is a maximum. Momentum is a, ma is a maximum. Remember that momentum is mass times velocity. Kinetic energy is a, is a maximum, a half mv squared, and velocity is a maximum. And the potential energy is zero. It's all been converted into, into um, kinetic energy. So at L, when, it, when, when the spring has just gone back to its original length, the net force acting is zero, and thus the acceleration is zero, and so on. Okay, that's enough on that. The total energy remains constant. You get a constant interconversion between kinetic and potential. Um, and it's the sum, the total energy of the system is always the sum of the kinetic energy and the potential energy put together. And you can end up with this lovely diagram. I like this diagram. And you, you, can, you can have a good look at that. There's some, it's quite clever, I think. Displacement, so you're going further away from the equilibrium position as you go out to either side. And if you imagine um, when the displacement is at, a, is, a, is at a maximum, the object has stopped, so the kinetic energy goes to zero, and the potential energy is at a maximum. And as it passes through the equilibrium position here, then you've got the fact that its potential energy has gone to zero, but its kinetic energy has got to a maximum. It's going as fast as it can. Mass on a spring, very famous formula, which you can derive. Um, I'm not going to here. The period of oscillation, that's the time taken for one complete oscillation, is equal to 2 pi root m over k. And k is the spring constant, the amount of force it requires to move, uh, to stretch the spring uh, by a metre. Okay? And it's, you've got numerical values for those. Direct correlation to bond strengths for, for chemistry. Simple harmonic motion, a, a term often used, often just abbreviated to uh, SHM. Its definition is this. I'm not going to derive the formulae, but a body accelerates towards a point at a rate which is proportional to its distance from that point. So the further out it, it's gone, as it comes back in, it, it's accelerating as quickly as it can back towards its starting position. And that's, that's the, the, the conditions to give rise to simple harmonic motion. Here are some, some formulae for that, uh, where omega is, is a positive constant. But uh, you, you, can, you can have a look at that, and, and it is in any A-level physics textbook. And it, you'll see that there's a connection here between the sine wave and simple harmonic motion. It's all good stuff. You can have a read. Simple harmonic motion, so good for chemical bonds as well as springs. The total energy of a, of a mass spring system, E, is the sum of the kinetic and potential energies. Okay, and so we say there's kinetic energy, there is the, um, the strain or elastic potential energy, and there's the total energy there. It's that diagram. There's kinetic, there's potential. And the formula for the frequency of a simple harmonic oscillator can be derived from the work that I showed you earlier, the frequency, remember that's, um, this is an important connection here, frequency is the inverse of the period, um, and so you can play with that equation I showed you a few moments ago, and you'll derive this formula. And that formula for the frequency of a simple harmonic oscillator is absolutely relevant for understanding infrared spectroscopy, where atoms on bonds are behaving like masses on springs. hope that was useful.